Well, hello and welcome to the Speakeasy. My name is Paul Feasy and today I'm joined by... I'm Glenn Scrivener. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Good to have you with us. And we're just looking off camera this direction, <laughs> even though we're looking at this camera in this little room. Yeah, yeah. we've got a bit of a strange setup today because we can't use our studio because we've actually got um, something being built in there. Yes. We're actually building uh, a spaceship. Of course. Yeah, because that's what we've done with all your money, basically. We're, we're like the Elon Musks of Eastbourne. Yeah, we um, can do it on the cheap, though. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, it's a, yeah, it's a very sort of hand-me-down kind of spaceship that we've got and uh, filled with all the old kind of media paraphernalia that has been hanging around in Speak Life for decades. Literally decades. Yeah. So it's got a kind of a red dwarf look to it with sort of old computer consoles and old photography and camera kits and yeah we think it'll it's a, it's a vibe it it's certainly a vibe. is a vibe and yeah. so that's all for part of picture this isn't it that we're working on yeah so three two one the next iteration of three two one where we're filming uh, a four a four part course that people can do uh, to be introduced to jesus vision of god the world and you and they are attached to these short films and one of them is set in space and so we've got to build a spaceship Great. And that's why we're in here today. That's why we're not in the studio. That's why Nate's not here. Nate's kind of overseeing all those bits there. So we're in this kind of slightly... Um, Pokey. Setup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it works. I just, yeah. That's why, like Glenn said, we've got this slightly strange camera thing going on where hey. by the magic of... Here oh, we yeah. go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so uh, anyway... Uh, on to what we're thinking about today. Uh, like, well, last week we were thinking about the Ascension, weren't mm -hmm. we? Yeah. Um, and we had a really good discussion about that because I think we, we kind of decided that the Ascension is one of those things that we probably as Christians know, we know of. We know what the Ascension is. Yeah. <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> but perhaps we don't really think about it that much. We no. don't really think what are the implications of it. And so we took a bit of a dive into that. And actually, we, you know, there's lots of great stuff in there about the Ascension and kind of what it means for us and why it's important and why Ascension Day maybe is something we should maybe make a bit more of a big deal of than we do. Yeah, people get like a day off in Germany and places like that. Wow. So, yeah. All right, isn't it? Yeah. Let's do that then. Let's yeah, do that. We'll definitely do it. Well, we're getting this Thursday off. <laughs> That's true. That's yes, true. Because of a different sovereign who ascended a different throne. But yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was a really good discussion. If you've not seen that, do go back and check out last week's Speakeasy. Um, but uh, 10 days from now, we have Pentecost coming up. Yes. And so we thought it might be good to have a look at Pentecost as well. well that's again, right. something we probably know about as Christians, but maybe we've not thought about hugely and the significance of it yep. uh, for us. Um, so, and yeah. it's always good to get people in to talk about these things who know more about it than we do. Mm. Um, so do you Always. want to kind of introduce our guest that we've got today? So yes, 10 days after Ascension, there is Pentecost. And so we thought, why not talk to a premier Pentecostal theologian, Jonathan Black. And we've got Dr. Jonathan Black coming in on the line. He is a lecturer. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you. Now you're at Regents College, is that right? I am indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Where is that? I'm in uh, Malvern in Worcestershire, up in oh, the hills. Yes. Okay. And is it a, a particular training college for, for Pentecostals who, who want to uh, get into ministry or, or is it sort of interdenominational? Um, we have students from lots of different denominations, but it is um, it is primarily a Pentecostal college and it's run by the Elam Pentecostal Church. Okay. So we will get into what that means, what it means to be a Pentecostal uh, as we go. But uh, what we wanted to do is dive really down into the depths of the goodness uh, of Pentecost and what is it we might be missing if we don't have a full appreciation for Pentecost. So maybe the first question is, we celebrated Ascension Day uh, last week. Um, how does Ascension and Pentecost fit together? Oh, they fit together really importantly, that you can't have one without the other. Um, that uh, I think sometimes there's the temptation to try and separate bits of what Jesus has done apart uh, as if uh, as if somehow we can focus on one bit without the other. But actually, we worship not a thing, but we worship a person. We worship Jesus. And so everything that he's done for us is uh, is essential. And um and especially that close connection between the Ascension and Pentecost, that on the day of Pentecost, when Peter gets up to explain what's happened, he, he goes back to the cross, he goes back to the resurrection, but he goes back especially to the Ascension, that it's because um, Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father, that the Father has now given him the spirit to pour out on the church. So you just can't have Pentecost without the Ascension. Okay, so Jesus goes up and the Spirit comes down. 
Um, why, why did Jesus have to go up for the Spirit to come down? That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> because Jesus said so. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said, it's, it's expedient for you that I go away um, because he is sending now uh, another comforter and it's another one like him. He's sending not, not someone instead of him, not someone uh, because we're we're done thinking about Jesus now and we can think about the Holy Spirit instead, but the Holy Spirit has come into the world to glorify Jesus, that he takes what is Jesus and declares it to us. Um, and so it's important that Jesus has risen up and sent it into heaven uh, to pour out the Holy Spirit so that the entire church throughout the entire world can know the presence of the Lord with them, that um, we don't just have uh, Jesus with certain disciples in certain places now, but by his Holy Spirit, he is present with all of us. Hmm. Very good. And I guess, I mean, we were going we to ask sort of what the significance of Pentecost is. I guess you've touched on it there and that the Spirit, therefore, I mean, Jesus, I suppose, as a, in the incarnation is... Um, is limited to one place, one time as a man, but yet when the Spirit comes, Christ, the Spirit of Christ can be present in all believers at all times. Mm -hmm. So that's, I suppose that if we were to say, you know, it, it, would you say that is the major significance of Pentecost? Yeah, uh, I think sometimes, I think sometimes we diminish Pentecost a little bit by saying things like it's the birthday of the church or something like that. Um, uh, and I think that really misses the main point because when we think of it that way, we're thinking of something about us. Um, that something new now about what we're doing now, but actually Pentecost is about Jesus, that he is the one who pours out the Spirit, that he is the one who's promised to come to us, um, that he would come to us and the Father would come to us when the Spirit is poured out on us. So uh, so, so it is that that presence of Jesus. And I think that's the, that's the big difference we see with Pentecost, that the people of God haven't suddenly started to exist. I mean, um, Abraham's the model believer that uh, if we want to know what a Christian looks like, the New Testament points us back to Abraham, that we can we can go all the way back to Eve um, when um, uh, in, in Genesis and see her declaration of faith in the coming um, of Christ. So we have we have the, we have Christians, we have the church, we have the people of God, the people who are united to Christ by faith all the way back to the beginning of time. Um, but now it's it's this it's this presence of the Lord with us um, mm. by the Spirit that is the big thing. So um, so it's not simply a birthday party for the church or something like that it, <laughs> it's 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 something much greater than that it's about the presence of the lord with us it's about that uh, that access we have um uh through the spirit and in christ to the father um uh, at all times and in all places mm -hmm. that's really helpful i think and for me when we when i think about pentecost that is something that comes to my mind this idea of presence because i think one of my the themes i get most excited about biblically is the idea of where does God dwell? God dwells mm -hmm. sort of, you know, in the garden, he's walking with his people. And then of course people are separated and he dwells in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, you know, in the tabernacle and then, you know, Christ tabernacles among us. But yet here we are now, we are the temple and the spirit yeah. is in us. And of course you look forward to revelation where, you know, um, you know, Christ dwells amongst his people again. Um, and for me, that's I like that 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 is an exciting uh, theme that I see kind of running through Scripture. So I guess Pentecost, yeah, is 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 a very integral part of that. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe it isn't something we think of that often. So. Is is there an uh, is there a link then? I just just thinking out loud that at the end of the building of the tabernacle in Exodus forty, you know, the glory of the Lord kind of fills the temple, and and I guess you've got in one Kings when Solomon builds the. The, the temple, so it was the tabernacle back in Exodus, the temple in Solomon's day. And again, the, the glory of the Lord sort of fills the temple. Is, is this what's going on in, in, in Pentecost, that the, the glory of the Lord is filling the temple of the church? I mean, that's what uh, Pentecostals love, those passages in the Old mm -hmm. Testament, because, uh, uh, because, they, uh, because they've always seen that connection, that here we have this demonstration with the physical tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament, but now we have a fulfillment of that with with this just this emphasis that the church is now the dwelling place of God in the spirit, that we are being built together as a living temple um, in the Lord, that um, that now we have, um, and it's not just 
is not just glory or it's not just fire or it's not just something that symbolizes the presence of God, um, but but rather it is that we really are this temple. We might not see that. It's far easier for us to see something like in the Old Testament with this physical temple and this physical fire and uh, and the cloud and the glory and the and, and the priests falling down. Um, uh, but but we're but those things have been written to teach us um, that even though we might not see in the same way um, that, that that's the reality, that we are the true temple, we are the true tabernacle, we are um, the dwelling place of God. And we have on the day of Pentecost, we have we have even that symbol of the, the tongues of fire, um, uh, just as the fire fell in the Old Testament. Um, we have the fire falling on the day of Pentecost to show that um, this isn't just you know about some experience a nice experience in a meeting that some people have in the upper room but this is something much more powerful than that this is something much more significant than that that this is this is the new temple that we are not because you know not because of us um but because of jesus because if jesus is the true temple um and the church what is the church is the body of christ that we are we are his members. We are um, we are in Christ. We we are part of um, the body of Christ, and so we we dwell in this uh, this new temple, um, even though we might not always see it. Um, but yet the Bible um, tells us that you know um, that uh, blessed are those <laughs> who haven't seen but believe. Um, that that we have this great blessing assured to us that we don't need to have seen that reality. Um, of the temple but um but as we believe what jesus has told us as we believe what we see um in the scriptures um that jesus is our head we are united to him and he is the anointed one and so we we partake of his anointing wow i was just thinking uh, something you said there was you know we are the temple um even if we maybe we don't always see that and it just got me thinking i, I wonder do you think that uh, now that we have the spirit living in us, what do you think that we as believers now have a different experience of the presence of God than an Old Testament believer in the sense that, you know, God would have been, where's the presence of God in the Old Testament? Well, in the tabernacle sort of over there, God is not in me specifically. Um, do you think day to day there's a difference between the experience of the Old Testament believer and New Testament believer, apart from the obvious kind of things about what well, we know who Christ is more clearly and things like that? Yeah, I, I think there seems to be. I think it's something quite mysterious um, uh, in the Bible that we know the Holy Spirit was active in believers' lives in the Old Testament. So um, David prays, but take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Um, uh, but we seem to have more examples in the Old Testament of the Holy Spirit coming upon people for specific tasks or um, at specific times. Um, and, and so it seems like we have access to something new. So uh, Isaiah um, uh, and in fact Ezekiel as well, they both, they both talk about a time that's coming when, when through the pouring of God's Spirit that people will say, um, people will realize they, uh, the sort of how they really belong to the Lord. Um, it's not that they didn't belong to the Lord, but, mm. but people are going to say, I am his. Um, that, um, that there's this fresh realization of, of, of that closeness that we have to the Lord. Um, uh, and uh, so, so there really does seem to be that promise in the Old Testament that there is some something new that's going to come about um, in the future, which is now the future we live in. Um, when the spirit is poured out so um so we have the same salvation as old testament believers but yet there does seem to be something that is different some new closeness of access that we have um after the day of pentecost mm. and i guess ultimately there will be an even greater closeness at the end of all things you know yeah. as, the, as we think about this idea of dwelling you know now god dwells in us but one day we will you know we'll we will see christ face to face and that will be a different experience again yeah I think that's really important when we think about the Old Testament too, because um, cause I think sometimes the temptation is to think if 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 we have something different because the Holy Spirit is poured out now, that then to start thinking as if our salvation is different or something like that. But ultimately, we'll all share in that same fullness of the Spirit um, in in the age to come. That um, nowadays, 
we only have Hebrews calls it a, a, for, a, a, a we taste of the powers of the age to come um, mm -hmm. when the spirit is poured out. So, so we only just have a little bit of a taste uh, of the future through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit now. Um, and uh, so we're privileged in having that. Um, but one day, along with the believers in the Old Testament, we will know the fullness of that um, when we see Jesus face to face, when we when we dwell in his presence forever. Let's have a look at Scripture. Let's have a look at Acts 2 and where it all began. Um, so uh, what's immediately striking to me is Acts 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Pentecost is already a thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, but it's also a reason why, you know, there were, according to Acts 2 verse 5, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Why were they there? They were there because there was already this thing called Pentecost. Can you explain what this thing called Pentecost was uh, in the Jewish believer's life? Yeah, um, so this was one of the three times in the year where people were to go up to the temple in Jerusalem. That's where people from all over the world there. And they're going up for this festival. And it's the festival, it's connected with the harvest, but it's particularly, particularly connected with the first fruits of the harvest. So... Um, so it comes uh, 50 days after the Passover. That's why it's called Pentecost, because that's about to do with the Greek word for 50. Um, and, uh, and now they're, they're going to celebrate the first fruits of, of the harvest together as they come up. And, uh, and they wave uh, um, uh, uh, offerings in the presence of God to give thanks for the first fruits. Okay. So we've had first fruits. And... Fascinatingly, the first fruits is on the third day after Passover. So you got Passover, and then on the third day, there's first fruits. And then 50 days after the first fruits, which is kind of this pledge of the coming harvest, then you have the sort of the coming of the crop that's been promised by first fruits. And it's, it's incredible. It's all laid out there in Leviticus chapters 26 and following. Um, or it was in chapter 23, isn't it? Um, and following. And so what you've got there is Passover, where the blood of the lamb is shed, first fruits, where you get, you know, the first pledge of the coming future. And then 50 days later, you get the, the, the coming, you know, the, the actual harvest comes in. Fast forward into the New Testament and you get the blood of the lamb shed at Passover. Christ dies. And then on the third day, he rises again from the dead as the first fruits of the coming bumper crop. And 50 days later, we get, we get Pentecost, which is why they are there on that day. They're all together in one place. And then uh, Acts 2 verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So help us out with tongues. What, what are these tongues? What are these languages? What is the meaning of them, especially in, uh, in an Acts 2 kind of context? So we've got these tongues in Acts 2, and uh, the people are there. Um, now, these are all people that are there for this harvest festival. Um, they come up to Jerusalem. They've come from all over the world, and we've got this list of uh, places they've come from and how they all hear that people speaking in their own language. Um, but they are not... But they're Jewish people who've come to celebrate um, the, the festival that they are believing uh, people that have come to celebrate in the presence of God. And so they know enough of the language um, to be able to come and take part in that celebration. So they're hearing the languages of the countries where they live, um, but they don't actually need someone to speak in their language. Uh, and so they're surprised when it happens um, because they, it, uh, this is not what they're expecting. They're not expecting a whole pile of people in uh, Jerusalem to be speaking their language. Uh, and so um, the Lord gives them uh, this gift of tongues. They go out, they start proclaiming the mighty uh, works of God in all these different languages. And people are astonished that um, in the languages of other peoples, in the languages of the world, um, uh, the works of God are being proclaimed. And why... Do you, do you see something going on that's similar to sort of Babel? I mean, quite often people um, draw the link between in Genesis 11, um, there is 
the desire to have a community to, a community together it's both a city with a tower that has its head in the heavens and so it's kind of like an anti-church in that sense it wants to have its head in the heavens mm -hmm. but it's a sort of a fleshy desire to unite and get to heaven as opposed to the way of the spirit that begins in genesis 12 and the, and the promises to abraham and that sort of thing so at that point languages were scattered um, and then in, in Acts 2, what you see is, is languages kind of united. Is, is, there, is there something to that as a link? Yeah, I think there is. Um, uh, I think that we have this division of languages where people can't understand that's coming out of that rebellion against God. And now as the sort of culmination of what God has been doing to restore people to himself through the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, and now the pouring out of the spirit of Pentecost, we have now people hearing um, that, that those barriers of communication uh, have have disappeared now, that they've been undone in some way. And okay, it's not, it's not entirely um, that uh, we are just in, in the first fruits of this uh, of this age to come, that there will be a day when when those human divisions are done away with um, entirely. But but we have this this sign that that God is reconciling people, that God is that God is reuniting what has been divided by sin. Um, but also that sign that um, that what He is doing is not just for one group of people, but what he is doing um, through the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus um, is for all the peoples of the earth. And so it has to be proclaimed in every language of the world because this is not just, this is not just for the people of Israel. This is not just for the Greeks. This is not just for, for, for Western people or something like that, but this is for, this is for every people on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. So, um, often when people talk about this, they, they talk about this idea of speaking in tongues. And then when you compare it to, say, passages sort of 1 Corinthians, there's this question about whether it, it's the same kind of thing going on there in 1 Corinthians as in Acts 2, or are these different things? Would you have any kind of thoughts on that? It's really interesting. Um, they're actually really confused um, at, at the very beginning of the Pentecostal revival um, uh, in America, in Azusa Street and things. Um, people got, got a bit confused about that because they saw people in Acts 2 speaking languages that people understood. Um, and they thought, oh, every time somebody speaks in tongues, it must be to help us make the gospel known to, to someone who wouldn't understand it otherwise. So um, so maybe it's to help us in missions or something like that. Um, but actually what we see in 1 Corinthians is um, we see warnings because people don't understand what is spoken in tongues. And so Paul says, unless there's an interpretation, don't speak in tongues in church because people come in and think you're mad because nobody understands what's going on. And how can people how can people say amen to something if they don't understand that? So so Paul makes it really clear in First Corinthians that um that normally other people don't understand what is spoken in tongues. And so it needs some sort of supernatural interpretation from God. Um, and uh, so it seems like what happened on the day of Pentecost was something quite unique um, in the history of, uh, of, of salvation and what God was doing. Mm. And so what then do we think might be going on? I mean, it, what is tongues then when we come to sort of the Corinthians passages? Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Um, yeah. Yeah. It is a mystery. Uh, I think that's a good thing to say. Um, I, I think that's the point of it, that, um, that we, we, we want to understand stuff. Um, we always want to understand stuff. And sometimes we need to be reminded that the Lord is far beyond our understanding that, yeah, we want to grow in our knowledge of God's, but, but, he is so far beyond the creation that we can we can only grasp onto uh, what he has revealed to us and only partially in that none of us have that perfect knowledge of the lord um and i think partly that's one of the things that tongues is doing in first corinthians that that we have something that we don't completely understand we have something that is beyond us that it seems to be um so Paul says, if there's no interpretation, um, that someone can speak uh, to themselves and to God in tongues. And it seems to be, here is some way 
that people can pray that is beyond what we can do with our own words, that is beyond our own understanding about prayer. Um, and, and that reminds us um, part, not only of the greatness and the glory of the Lord and how far beyond us he is, but it reminds us too that our prayers don't rely on on the perfection of our words um, or how good we are at remembering everything we need to pray for. But actually, every time we pray, we're relying on Jesus. We're relying on the Holy Spirit, that it's the Spirit who helps us pray, Paul tells us. Um, that the scripture tells us that we, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray relying on what he has done for us. He is our mediator and our great high priest. He is the one who is before the throne of God for us. And he takes our feeble and imperfect prayers and our misremembered things that we're supposed to be praying for and we're sometimes saying the wrong words. Um, and, and he purifies them and he perfects them and he presents them right to his Father in heaven. Um, so that, um, as Calvin said, we pray as it were through Jesus' lips. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think tongues in a way reminds us of that, that it reminds us how weak we are. It reminds us how we're not relying on ourselves, that we need to rely on on Jesus and on the Holy Spirit when we come into the presence of the Lord in prayer. So you mentioned uh, Azusa Street uh, earlier. That's obviously um, got a, a huge importance in sort of Pentecostal kind of history. Um, can you tell us um, what is Azusa Street? What happened there? And where, where really did sort of the modern Pentecostal movement come from? Okay, um, that's a really complicated question to ask <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, to ask uh, an academic because um, academics have lots of arguments about where did Pentecostalism come from and things like that. Um, I think God seems to have been doing things in different places around the world that were very similar at the same time. So in this country, we had the Welsh Revival and there was big emphasis on um, on the on the Holy Spirit's work and the baptism of the Holy Spirit in, in the Welsh Revival. And we see um, things like people speaking in tongues and prophecies and healings and things during the Welsh what Revival. What kind of year are we thinking about here? So the Welsh Revival is the last Welsh Revival was in 1904, 1905. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, and so just around the same time in America, 1906 in America, we've got um, Azusa Street Revival. Um, and uh, in Azusa Street, um, there are actually some connections with the Welsh Revival and things, but... Um, what happens is there is um, a, a preacher who has gone out to Los Angeles. Um, he's been invited out to um, to be pastor of a church there. And he gets there and he starts preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and um, people in the church aren't very happy. Um, so they say we don't we don't really want you anymore. Um, and uh, so, but um, but some people um, ask him to to lead a prayer meeting. Uh, and in this prayer meeting, people start getting saved, um, people um, start getting baptized in the spirit, and it grows out of the house it's in. They find an old uh, um, rundown abandoned church that's been used as a stable on Azusa Street, and they start having these meetings in Azusa Street. And and it's often called, like, it's called the Azusa Street Revival because it's associated with the place more than the person. It was William J. Seymour was um, the preacher, but he used to sort of hide his head behind the pulpit because he, he didn't want any attention drawn to him. Um, he insisted all, all the time that um, all the glory had to go to Jesus for everything that was going on. Uh, and people started hearing about what was happening in Azusa Street. People travelled from all over the world to Azusa Street to find out what was going on. There were reports in the newspapers around the world. Um, and, uh, and from there, um, Pentecostalism started to spread um, all over the world very quickly. Mm. So you mentioned there that um, he came to the church and started preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I can already hear lots of conservative evangelicals shifting uneasily in their seats, um, thinking, what's this? What are you talking about? Um, go, go into a bit of detail, if you can, just about what do you mean by the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Uh, are we talking about something distinct from coming to faith? Um, yeah, it'd be good to hear right. your thoughts. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, at the time, 
most conservative evangelicals were quite happy with something called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So uh, the Keswick Convention and stuff like that, there's lots of preaching on baptism of the Holy Spirit. All the great um, sort of uh, well-known uh, evangelical preachers of the day, like Andrew Murray and people were preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, um, so that sort of flows into the Welsh Revival and things like that. Um, and I think sort of the way we think about that now has been transformed partly by the rise of pentecostalism and the charismatic movement um and so people have quite different um reactions to phrases like that today than they did um a uh, hundred years ago um so yeah so pentecostals um saw the baptism of the holy spirit as something different from getting saved um so the what they saw in the book of acts was a sort of pattern that people got saved but people also um encountered um the lord in some sort of powerful way um that was tangible um and, and looked different from salvation and sometimes it happened at the same time as people got saved so you have like cornelius in his household um in acts 10 11 um but a lot of times there's 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 some distinction in time it might not be a very big distinction in time um uh but it might be shorter, might be longer. So we have, um, for example, the Samaritan believers in Acts chapter 8, that they believe the gospel, they receive the word of God, they're baptized in water. Um, but then somehow it says they, they have none of them had yet received the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and Peter and John have to come down from Jerusalem and pray for them. And then they receive the Holy Spirit. And, and people see, Simon the sorcerer sees that something has happened when they receive the Spirit. Um, Paul, he meets some... Um, disciples in um, in Acts 19 in Ephesus, um, and he asks them, um, "Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed?" And they say, "We don't. We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit." Um, and uh, so he baptizes them in water, and after they baptize in water, they receive the Holy Spirit. So, so the Pentecostals sort of look to this as a as a sort of pattern um, uh, in in the Book of Acts, um, uh, and so they. Uh, they were saying this could be something that happens at the same time as people get saved. It could be something that happens at another time, but their distinction wasn't so much about the time it happens, but it was what's what is this? Um, that and they saw it as as the Holy Spirit coming on people and empowering them um, to tell other people about Jesus, essentially. So um, so they often talk about power for evangelism or for mission or something like that. Um, that the idea was. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He glorifies Jesus. So when he comes in in a tangible, powerful way in our lives, that's not that we have some feeling, but that's to glorify Jesus in our lives so that we can make Jesus known, that he can be glorified as other people put their faith in Jesus as well. So how does that relate to our first baptism? How does that relate to our coming to faith, let's say? Yeah. Um, if in Ephesians 1 language, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is ours in Christ, what, what room is there for extra spiritual blessing? How do, how do you relate those two things together? Ah, oh, good question. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, Rory Shiner wrote a great little book called uh, One Together, I think. Um, One Forever, yeah. One Forever, um, uh, and where he talks about union of Christ, and he uses this great illustration of an airplane, about what, what happens to the airplane happens to you, that um, your destiny, um, when you're traveling by plane, um, your destiny is is controlled by being on the plane. Um, uh, and and he compares that to the union of Christ and um, and to expand upon it, he might not like what I have to say, but um, to expand on his illustration, um, I think, that's a bit like how we can understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit too, because when you get on an airplane, um, if you go anywhere far, because um, you've been on far airplanes, Glenn, to go to. I have. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes when you're on an airplane for a very long time, you need to eat some things. Um, you need a few meals uh, on a long journey. And you don't just get when you sit down and put on your seatbelt and the emergency demonstration is done they don't just dump all the food in front of you and on your tray table and say there you go keep yourself going for the next 16 hours in the flight or whatever um but but those meals come to you at the right time um they're yours you've bought the tickets you've paid for the foods um uh, they are yours as soon as you get on that plane but you don't get them the moment you get on the plane uh, and the christian life's like that um we know the Christian life's like that because 
we, as part of our salvation, get a resurrection body, and we don't have it yet. Um, mm. uh, uh, we might wish we had it yet, <laughs> um, but uh, um, but it's something we look forward to um, in the future. And um, but it's it's not like something extra that's added on to our salvation. It's it's part of the salvation that we already have, um, and uh, uh, so. So when when Paul writes that every that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, um, that he's not saying every spiritual blessing except for the resurrection body or uh, or anything like that. But but that resurrection body that is included in the blessing that we've already been blessed with in Christ when we were united to Him. And I'd say the same thing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that um, that it's something that we might experience um, later on. Um, that we might experience it straight away, but we might, uh, there might be some delay before we experience it. Um, there might even sometimes be a long delay before we experience it, but it's something that is, um, that is, that is ours through our union with Christ, that it's not something we have to do something extra to get or something like that, but it is, it is through what Jesus has done for us. So Peter in the day of Pentecost, he says, but, um, uh, about this same Jesus um, that you took and crucified, that God has raised him up, um, and as he you now pours out what you see in here, so he connects um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit back to the cross and the resurrection and the ascension. Um, there's nothing that we need to add on to that. Jesus has accomplished it all. Jesus has uh, Jesus has has done that for us, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that. We experience everything that Jesus has for us right at the very first moment of salvation. Because uh, salvation isn't just like a change of categories or something like that. Salvation is being united to Jesus, having a new life in Christ, and uh, uh, and that. So salvation is that ongoing thing with Jesus, and and He will be with us uh, in 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 fresh ways uh, at moments when we need it in our Christian life. That. Um, that we all know that we've gone through, um, we've gone through hard times and uh, and known the presence of the Lord in a very uh, precious way that that might seem different to to what we've known before, um, because he he doesn't just say right that's it uh, I've done uh, um, you've had everything the moment you got you got saved uh, the Christian life isn't like. Um, it isn't like a, a, a children's toy that you wind up a wee car that you wind up and then uh, Jesus just lets it go off mechanically. It, it, yeah. 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 Um, that it is that, that ongoing relationship with Jesus. Given the ongoingness of it though, wouldn't that be an argument for many, many, many blessings, not just second blessings, yeah. many baptisms of the Holy spirit, not just the baptism of the Holy spirit, many meals on the way to Sydney, not just one halfway. It depends how good the airplane food is, Glenn. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Um, hmm. So Paul writes to the Ephesians to be filled with the Spirit, but it's in the continuum. So keep on hmm. being filled hmm. with the Spirit. Um, we see that the people who are baptized in the Spirit in Acts 2, we see them being filled afresh in Acts 4 in a prayer meeting. Um, so it's it's not a one-off thing. And I think the what, that could be one of the dangers in Pentecostalism that people could sort of think as if the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like a goal to arrive at, and um, and then that's it. So I can sit back now. Uh, I've had uh, I've had it, um, but it's not. It's, it's it's the beginning of something. We use the term baptism of the Holy Spirit for that sort of first one because that's the way we sort of see scripture using the language um that we only seem to see it used once. Baptism is a sort of initiatory language. Um, but the Bible does keep talking about being filled with the Spirit, and it looks quite similar to um, to to that to that first one. So, um, mm. so yeah, um, uh, that's, uh, that's yet another reason why I don't like language about second blessings and stuff like that, because we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ, um, and and there's much more than uh, for us in Jesus than simply dividing up into one or two blessings. Mm. Yeah, the idea of the the kind of baptism of the Holy Spirit often. It's often talked about in a way that it's it's quite like it's a very dramatic event. Um, <laughs> did you would you expect it that to be a dramatic thing for all people? Because I'm just thinking there might be people who are thinking, well, 
have I have I had an event like this? Has this happened to me? And would we expect, I mean, again, lots of people associate it with speaking in tongues as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what would you kind of say to people who are asking those kind of questions? Like, should I be, you know, should I have been spoke, speaking in tongues and I mm -hmm. haven't, or could I have had this happen to me and I don't really know it's happened? And Good question. Um, so I think in the Bible, what we see is the difference between getting saved and, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit seems to be something that is quite tangible. Um, so you seem to know that something has happened, and, and other people seem to know what, that something's happened too. So especially that example of Simon the Sorcerer, that he sees this thing, he wants to buy this power because he sees that something has happened. Um, so there seems to be something tangible that is there. Often in the Bible, um, in the book of Acts, often it's linked with um, speaking in tongues, sometimes with prophecy. Um, but more generally, I think if, if we zoom out from the book of Acts, um, when the Holy Spirit comes upon people in the Bible, um, when we have this language of the Spirit coming on people um, or the Spirit um, uh, falling on someone, um, we often have um, some sort of um uh, uh as, as theologically often say but inspired speech of some sort um so um so you can see examples even in in the early chapters of luke um that you see mary's magnificat you see um uh, you see um Simeon's song um, that uh, you see some sort of response that people speak out something of the wonderful works of God. Um, uh, and uh, so it is, um, I think, uh, Pentecostals would argue that, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite often, quite normally, that would be um, sitting first and speaking in tongues. Um, but um, but I think there are other ways that we can see as people speak out good news, as people have that sort of freedom in speaking out that good news of Jesus, that there is some powerful thing that brings glory to Jesus in our lives, that fills us with love for Jesus, that causes us to want to speak out um, of the wonders of Jesus. I, I think in Ephesians 5, when Paul says about being filled with the Spirit, he sort of talks about um, giving thanks for Jesus, about singing uh, the praise of Jesus, um, uh, about speaking to one another about Jesus. Um, so, so it's something that will overflow in our lives with 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 speech that glorifies jesus is is i think how i could boil it down to its uh, mm. to its essential mm. yeah, that's helpful that tangibility thing is is fascinating isn't it that so often in acts there's just the expectation that you know who is full of the spirit and who isn't mm -hmm. that you uh, and you you appoint um, deacons, for instance, because they're full of the spirit and of wisdom, or full of the spirit and faith, um, as the beginning of, of Acts six sort of says, and you know, in the pastoral epistles, and um, yeah, there there is an expectation a that people will be filled with the spirit, and that you will know that they are filled with the spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's interesting, um, and I, I guess as a as a very Christ centered theologian, you would say, Jonathan, the way to seek the filling of the spirit is is what how should how should we do that i would say um that it's jesus is the one that pours out the holy spirit mm -hmm. so if we want to seek being filled with the spirit we need to be seeking jesus um that he is the one who has been anointed with the spirit beyond measure um that he is the christ the anointed one um um he is the one um from whom the spirit proceeds so um so we need to be looking to jesus and um, if we want experiences of the spirit or if we want to if we want to see spectacular gifts or something like that we're looking at the wrong thing entirely uh, we're looking um the holy spirit's work is always to bring glory to jesus and so if what we care about is miraculous signs if what we care about is spectacular things happening in church on a sunday if, if what we care about is some feeling um uh in in our own experience that actually we've lost the 
the point of what this is and uh, and we're getting distracted from what's most important that mm. jesus is the one who um who baptizes in the spirit that's what john the baptist but john the baptist told us two things about jesus he's the lamb of god he takes away the sins of the world and he's the one who would baptize uh, in the holy spirit and fire um uh, and so um uh, so if we want to know the spirit's fullness we need to keep our eyes fixed on jesus mm. very good um so earlier you you mentioned about the charismatic movements um, as well as Pentecostalism, how do, how, how do we fit these pieces of the jigsaw together? So what, what is the charismatic movement? Is it separable from Pentecostalism? Is it a distinct thing? Is it, yeah, how, how do we put these things together? Oh dear, another difficult question. Um, <laughs> I think I think there's there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of overlap. Um, they both influence one another a lot. Um, uh, more and more as time goes on. Um, historically, they have different origins. Um, uh, but I think um, uh, I was trying to think about this lately because um, I'm working on a book and uh, uh, and one of the chapters in the book is about what is the difference between Pentecostals and Charismatics and um, uh, and so I had to think about it uh, and what really crystallised it for me was uh, was com was um, something. Um, something someone in new frontier said um because i think new frontiers is uh, is a charismatic movement that is really really similar to uh to pentecostalism that um uh that many pentecostals many new frontiers people you can put much difference between them um and uh, and that's the way i always thought of it until someone uh, a new frontiers pastor said to me um that uh no one speaks about the blood of jesus just those crazy old pentecostals <laughs> and I was like, well, on earth, of course we do the blood of Jesus. What's crazy about that? The blood of Jesus is the most important thing. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and that sort of helped me see a little bit what, what the difference is. Um, I think it comes down to those two words, Pentecostal and charismatic. Pentecost is about something that Jesus does. Um, so Pentecostals often talk about Jesus as the saviour, Jesus as the healer, Jesus as the baptizer and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus as the soon coming king. And so if they want to sum up Pentecostalism, they sometimes talk about um, uh, this four, four square gospel or something like this, um, about these four, uh, it's all four things about Jesus. So uh, you sometimes see like old pictures of, Pente like, well, they used to have um, huge Pentecostal Easter services in the Royal Albert Hall and they used to have huge big banners at the front one saying Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forever and the other saying four square upon the infallible word of God um, uh, and this four square was about these four things about Jesus yeah tell me about the four square because I've heard is, is there a four square businessman's association or something um, oh yeah um, I, Obviously. I, I think there is yeah referring, um, referring uh, back to the four square thing what is yeah. the four square thing so the four square is just this um, that Jesus is saviour, Jesus is healer, Jesus is baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the soon coming king. So, right. so it's, it's the idea that Pentecostals don't, well, we do believe in a thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but our focus isn't on a thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or a thing called healing, or a thing called salvation, or a thing called the second coming. Our focus is on Jesus, and he's the one who does all that. Um, and uh, I think that's part of the difference between um just a little bit of the focus between Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. Charismatic movement gets its name from the charismata, the gifts of the spirit. Um, and so sometimes maybe the emphasis is slightly more on, um, on the gifts, um, on the continuity of those gifts today. Pentecostals believe in that. Um, just our focus is slightly different, um, that it's going to be Jesus as the one who pours out the spirit. Uh, and as a result of that, these gifts are, are are bringing glory back to Jesus, and and always at the centre of that is going to be the blood of the cross that Jesus came to to shed His blood for us. That Jesus came to take our place on the cross of Calvary, and that every every spiritual blessing that we have now in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus has flown from what Christ has done for us um, in in dying in our place on the cross uh, and rising again victorious from the dead. Very good. And therefore, so the the historical development of the charismatic movement, you would say, is is that more a is that more a nineteen sixties seventies thing than a sort of a nineteen hundred kind of thing? Yeah. Where, where where would you trace things? So um, yeah, a sort of uh, a few things come along in the late nineteen fifties, the early nineteen sixties. Um, you have um, 
in this country, it starts with um, some brethren assemblies where um, the brethren and Pentecostals always had a lot in common, and um, uh, and some uh, so there's some uh, brethren assemblies that suddenly start to. Uh, experience the gifts of the spirit in their meetings and um, then some things start happening in the church of england um you have uh michael harper at also was lying in place um uh and which sort of begins these discussions within the church of england some people uh uh some people like what he has to say some people don't even within also a in place that um that the that um so john stott writes a, a book in response um uh setting out um what we'd think of i suppose now more, more as the as as what nowadays we'd call the conservative uh, evangelical position um uh, and we see that sort of parting of the ways um a little bit between the two um in america again it's within the episcopal church in america that you have um um some some ministers um st starting to teach about the baptism and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and um uh, and, and as I say, a lot of this is really, sim especially at the beginning, a lot of this is really similar to what Pentecostals are saying, um, uh, and uh, um, just in a in a different setting. Um, uh, and um, and often their church settings where people just would never have met Pentecostals before or had any interaction with them. And uh, and so it's, it's sort of like when Pentecostals and Charismatics start to discover each other, it's a it's a bit of a surprise on both sides. <laughs> And, and what's going on, therefore, sort of globally, world mission-wise? Um, because we, we hear lots about, you know, the, the church in South America and, and lots of, you know, um, Pentecostal kind of church growth uh, in Africa as well. And, and so give us a, give us a glo global picture of uh, what the state of Pentecostalism is. Yeah, um, Pentecostalism is m huge outside of the Western world. Um, uh, that um, there are countries now where um, where Pentecostals um, and Charismatics make up the majority of of Christians. Um, so um, so you can think of somewhere like Brazil, um, where between the Pentecostal churches and the Charismatic movement within other churches, um, that mo that the vast majority of uh, of of, of Christian churches in in Brazil, um, which are about hundreds of millions of people, um, uh, uh, ha have these sort of Pentecostal beliefs. Um, so, uh, so Pentecostalism has been a missionary movement from the beginning. So, right from the beginning, it's this idea that the reason that the Holy Spirit is poured out in this way. Um, is to empower us to go and tell other people about Jesus. And so, right from the beginning, at this little. Uh, this little mission in Azusa Street in Los Angeles, where people are really poor. It's it's a rundown church that used to be used as a stable that they've cleared out to have these meetings in, um, uh, and yet right from the beginning they start sending missionaries all over the world. Um, that um, uh, that they have this confidence that just as the Lord has poured out the Spirit to give people boldness and assurance to talk about what Jesus has done for them, that He's going to provide the means to do it as well. Uh, and uh, so they have the confidence that they're not relying just on their own resources but uh, they have that confidence to pray for the resources that are needed to to, to buy tickets to uh, to sail across the ocean to to go and um uh, and take the gospel and, and and so we see that right from the outset and uh, and I, I think you would be hard pressed to find any pentecostal movement anywhere today that doesn't have a huge missionary emphasis um uh, and a huge a huge desire to be praying for world missions to be sending um people um uh, to to spread the gospel all over the world and uh, and that's reflected not just in foreign countries but also locally people want to tell people round about them about jesus people want to see new people coming into church and uh, and getting saved um people people want to see people's lives transformed by the living jesus um so so that huge emphasis on evangelism and missions um uh, which has resulted in in huge growth in pentecostal churches um all around the world so like the denomination where i'm a minister is uh is um is really small in this country um and yet um where it started in this country um and yet we've got like 16 million members around the world um 
because of that huge emphasis that has been right from the very beginning on on sending out missionaries, um, on sending out evangelists, on sending out people to make Christ known. And it seems to be a missionary movement that um, has traction in a lot of non-Western cultures. Um, any guesses as to as as to why the, there's an appeal to non-Western cultures more than to, to Western ones? Yeah, I think um, Pentecostals. I think this is why Pentecostals is much smaller in the West. We believe in strange stuff that most people <laughs> don't <laughs> in our culture to believe in. But, um, we believe that the Lord is active every day in the world around us. We believe in, we believe that the devil is real. We believe in angels. Uh, we, we believe that God provides in miraculous ways. Uh, we believe that we can pray for people to be healed and uh, and that the Lord does heal people. Uh, I'm not saying that the Lord always heal. He doesn't guarantee that he'll always heal. Sometimes the Lord works through sicknesses. Um, but but we have that but we have that sort of faith that we can bring all these things to the Lord. And uh, I, I sort of find that you know <laughs> that's difficult to, to 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 sort of think from a Western perspective about in that I grew up as a Pentecostal, so these things are really normal to me. Um uh but um uh like my own life has been sort of shaped by this that I was really sick when I was born. Um, the pastor came to the hospital because he wanted to, to see my mother and see the new baby. Um, but because he was just about to leave, he'd had his farewell service. Uh, and I was born just before he left uh, to come back to the mainland. And um, uh, he came, got to the hospital. So I was sick, convinced the nurses that it wouldn't do any harm uh, to take me out of the incubator just for a minute for a prayer. And, um, and I was healed. Um, uh, mm. And so, so, so I've grown up with this. There's perfectly normal that people get healed. It's, it's perfectly normal to see the Lord's intervention in all these ways. Uh, and I think a lot of people outside the Western world um, have that. Um, have that. That that is normal in their mindset as well. Um, whereas in uh, in our Western culture, these things are very weird. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I think I think that really resonates beyond the Western world that. That we're not just, you know, you know, doctrine is really important. Um, what we believe is really important, um, but we're not just coming with a message of a historic faith that we're looking back, um, but on the basis of what God has done historically in Christ for us through His cross and resurrection, that uh, that we can know His power by the Spirit in our lives today. Hmm. How can we, as Christians or as churches, be kind of more Pentecostal as Pentecost rolls around this year? Ah, uh, well, I think really fixing our eyes on Jesus is the most Pentecostal thing that we can do. Um, and talking about Jesus and telling other people about Jesus, um, that that's, that's what we see on the day of Pentecost. People are there. They are waiting, they are praying, they are looking to Jesus, and then they go out and they speak about Jesus, and they tell other people about Jesus, and other people come to faith in Jesus, and they're baptized and added to the church, and then they go out and tell others about Jesus as well. So that fixing our eyes on on Jesus and that desire um, to, to make him known, to bring glory to him in every way. Um, and, and in that, Part of that is is asking him um, for um, the outpouring of his Holy Spirit, and I don't think that's just limited to Pentecostals. Um, I don't think that has to be limited to how Pentecostals understand it, Oliver. Um, that Jesus talks in Luke eleven about uh, about praying to the Father and asking him um, for the Holy Spirit. So I think we're all encouraged by Jesus um, to do that, um, but not because we want some spectacular experience or some nice feeling we do that because the spirit glorifies jesus that that's what he's come to do and, and we want to glorify jesus in every possible way mm -hmm. Great. Really helpful. Mm -hmm. jonathan thank you very much if people want to catch up with you more online or more with the uh, regents college how can they do that people can find me or can find the college um on twitter that's probably the easiest way very good yes yes Jonathan is a brilliant follow on Twitter, so look for... Is it black underscore Jonathan? Is that... 
Uh, I think it's Jonathan underscore black underscore. Jonathan underscore black underscore. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, it's been, it's been fascinating, uh, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Um, you you always help me to fix my eyes on Jesus a lot more. And, uh, I think if that's the, the true meaning of being Pentecostal and sign me up, sign me up. Mm. <laughs> um, Brilliant. And uh, next week, we're going to think about uh, Trinity Sunday. So following Ascension Sunday, then you go Pentecost Sunday, and then you reflect back on the whole of the gospel events, and you start thinking about the God of the gospel, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So uh, stay tuned next week, and we'll think some more about Trinity Sunday. But thanks very much, Paul. Thanks, Glenn, and thanks, Jonathan, and thanks to everybody who's joined us this week, and we'll catch you again next time. Take care. See ya. Thank you.